All right, can everyone hear me? I can never get used to the fact of whenever I speak through a microphone, I hear it through there, and this is weird. So, all right, so as I said, my name is Kimberly Howell. I'm with the Texas a and Forest Service. Um, I just started with the Forest Service back in November. Uh, before that, I worked for three and a half, almost four years with Texas A&M AgriLife Research. Um, there in Stephenville. I worked on different prairie restoration projects with the Texas uh, Seed Research Project. All right, so they kind of already talked about my background. Um, I did my master's on in ag. Um, my research was on Little Bluestem. How many of y'all have? <laughs> <laughs> At the very beginning of my project. So during the summertime when it's nice and green like this, it produces an oil. And so my project was, you know, really, I was really into the little blue stem. Um, and anywhere that my body touched the grass and was in it for a long time, it broke out in hives. So it produces some sort of oil. I went to my thesis advisor and I said, hey, I think I'm allergic to this. And he's like, well, that sucks and laughed. <laughs> so there's that. All right, so I'm sure that y'all already kind of know a lot of this information. Um, Ecoregions, we have a lot of them in Texas. Texas is very big, it's very diverse, right? Okay, so what is the importance of ecoregions? Well, we have the abiotic and the biotic factors. So with the abiotic, we have our soil types, the pH, precipitation, and temperature. That's gonna influence what grows and how it grows and what animals are gonna be there, right? We also have the biotic, which is our plant, wildlife, and our pollinator species. It doesn't matter where you go throughout Texas, you're gonna see a little bit of a difference, right? You don't see pronghorns here, right? It's a little bit different. You're gonna see them more in West Texas. Okay, so ecological succession, what is it? It describes the process of change in a vegetative community. Um, it's over time. Okay, it's a bit, depending on what type of ecological session it is, it can be a shorter time or a longer time. And we're talking hundreds to thousands of years. Okay, this is a nonlinear process. And there's two types, we have primary and we have secondary. All right, the primary succession is the establishment of vegetation in areas that previously lacked soil, vegetation, and or nutrients. So we are talking about volcanoes, uh, glaciers, um, sand dunes, or flooding, okay, followed by soil erosion. This is what we're talking about with primary succession. Okay, so we're seeing, we have the pioneer stages right here. So this is all the rocks and it starts breaking down. We get into the intermediate stages where we're in our grasslands and kind of shrubby. And then we have our climax. Okay, that's where all of our big vegetation, all of our trees come in. Okay, secondary succession. This is a little bit different. This occurs um, when biotic organisms recolonize a habitat after a major disturbance. We're talking about ice storms, fires, um, tornadoes, flooding, disease, so forth, right? What did we have last year in the wintertime in February? We're seeing that now. We're seeing this secession. Um, you know, across Texas, we have seen damage to all of our plant species. Our trees were devastated, right? And a huge part of that is because it had been warm and then it had a major freeze. But the thing is, is right before we had that freeze, all of our trees were starting to bud out. Um, they were thinking it was springtime. So flowers were starting to bloom on a lot of our trees. So Eastern red buds, a lot of them died. So we're seeing that. This one occurs over a short amount of time. So think about fire, you know, a little field got caught on fire, right? And yeah, it's all nice and black whenever that, right after that happens. But then it turns nice and green and lush and we have beautiful wildflowers after, right? So, no, we're so quiet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in your work, do you pay much attention to the incidence of wildfires? And is it, the, 
incidence of wildfire? Is it does it vary according to the ecoregions? I mean, Texas, as far as the weather goes, do you know anything about that? Okay, so from what I'm understanding, you're asking about do I follow how wildfire impacts the different environments in Texas? Just the incidence or, or the, the preponderance of wildfire in the area. There's yeah. A lot of it. Yes, there is. So as you all know, in 2011, we had that huge drought, right? Um, I don't know how familiar y'all are with the Possum Kingdom Lake area, right? That area was devastated by fire, that whole area. Um, and so I actually have a map up in my office of all the fires in 2011 throughout my region, um, which, as I said, I cover 29 counties in North Central Texas. That's a pretty huge area. But if you look at the whole state of Texas in 2011 and the fires that occurred are pretty much the entire state was red. There was that many fires. Um, a lot of it was, you know, drought. Um, we just had, we had gone through this huge drought for a couple of years back to back. So there was no moisture, um, you know, people dragging chains on the back of their trucks can spark up a fire. Um, if the conditions are just right, and I'm saying just right, a cigarette bud can cause a fire. But that's very unlikely unless it, everything, all the environmental conditions line up perfectly, okay? Campfires, people not putting out their campfires properly, that can cause a wildfire. So all these different things, but yes, I do follow. Um, and I've gone back to these areas, especially with, near the Possum Kingdom area, and I have looked at how the vegetation has responded since then. All right, so the history of the prairies. Historically, it covered 170 million acres in North America. That's a pretty big area, right? Um, but more recently, um, it was one of the more recently developed ecosystems in North America, formed approximately 18,000 years ago. Um, it was after the Paleocene Glaciation. So we all think of like Montana and like Glacier National Park, right? It's way up here. Who would have ever thought that we had glaciers all the way in Texas? I mean, it's crazy, but then again, Texas used to be the ocean. <laughs> I always laugh when people ask, like say, when I go and do um, uh, stewardship plans, they're like, I want to restore it to its you know, historical environment. Well, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> I mean, really, it changes a lot. Okay, so the three major stresses across the prairie, um, we had the climate, the grazing, so the bison herds. I mean, people talked about how they would ride through one bison herd for three days in Texas, going from South Texas all the way up to North Texas. It took them three days to ride through this one herd. Fire, fire naturally occurred every three or five years in the prairie. And funny enough, the Native Americans learned that the bison followed the uh, fires because you know the new vegetation would come up and it'd be more, have more nutrients in it and everything, right? They would start the fires themselves. So they're essentially doing prescribed burns so that they could get the bison back. Kind of smart. All right, so as we know, prairies uh, split up into different uh, regions, right? So we have our tall grass prairies. And this is this area is historically a tall grass prairie area, if y'all weren't already aware of that. Um, so because we're about right here. All right. And then in the middle, we have this uh, mixed prairie. And then we have the short grass prairie. Okay. So we have all three types in Texas. Yeah. I would consider, how many of y'all are familiar with like Harry Grama? Have y'all ever heard of it? Um, so, well, little blue stem's a big grass. Yeah, that's one of our tall grass prairie um, grasses. Um, but funny enough, tall um, little blue stem actually occurs in almost every single state in the United States, even going up into Canada. It has a huge range. Um, but when I'm talking about a short grass prairie grass, I'm talking maybe about this tall. Not very big. Um, that's about how big Harry Grama is. 
it's out here it's pretty bushy it looks like other gramas where it has that little flag do y'all know what i'm talking about all right um so we had a change over time european agricultural practices came to the united states that means that we put up fences we brought in cattle that was not um native here um putting up the fences decreased the ability for the bison to move around naturally right um over hunting of the bison that was another factor um we brought in non-native plant species uh, for feed for cattle big one is kr bluestem i'm assuming that a lot of y'all are pretty familiar with that um we also have johnson grass uh bane of my existence is horrible um we also have bermuda grass that was brought in again i i can't stand it so when people say oh i want to plant this i'm like no please don't it's awful um and it's it's so hard to get rid of whenever you're doing a restoration project um so we saw grazing pattern differences between bison and cattle okay they're not grazing over huge areas right uh, people were notorious for overgrazing their cattle in one pasture. And we still see this today. And it's really hard to break that pattern because people say, oh, this is what my family's done for hundreds of years. Okay, well, that's not right. We need to break this. Um, so it makes it very difficult. We got rid of fire that caused woody encroachment. So yes, we used to have trees in Texas. I'm not saying we didn't have trees but Texas was primarily prairie, okay? Um, and then we'd have little small pockets of trees. And of course, East Texas is the exception. I like to consider it more like Louisiana than anything. And I can say that because I have property out there, okay? And essentially, I like to say, you know, it's like Louisiana kind of threw up into Texas, right? <laughs> it was just magically there. Um, so East Texas is definitely the exception. And then we get into our cross timbers area where there's some trees scattered but we were definitely more of a prairie area. When people say that they rode through a bison herd for three days, you don't see bison herds in trees. This is not what you're gonna see. Okay, just to give you all kind of a, a reference point, I don't know how well y'all can really see this. Um, this is over in Mineral Wells near my office. Okay, this right here is a highway. This is 180. Okay, this was 1985. That was not that long ago. Okay. And I'm kind of talking about like right in this area. Okay, I don't, the pointer doesn't work. So, or else I'd use it. But um, I'm talking right in here. And that's pretty much grassland. But then you come over here. This is the exact same image, but for 2021. This is now all forested and it's all ash juniper. Um, that's a pretty big deal, right? You know, we've got people that haven't been clearing their land. Um, historically, fire would actually take care of getting rid of a lot of the smaller um, ash juniper trees and the mesquite, you know, all the ones that people don't really want, but then they don't like fire either. So we kind of need to get away from this idea of anti-fire. That's kind of what I'm getting at. All right, some of the benefits of prairies. I know a lot of y'all have seen this image before. I know I see it almost everywhere I go that has anything to do with grasslands. Um, I think it's a pretty powerful image. That's why I like to show it. Um, grasslands, you know, you wouldn't think it because, you know, people think uh, rainforest are going to have the most abundance of wildlife and habitat, right? All the resources. But really, prairies provide a very unique and very specific habitat for a lot of our wildlife species. Um, they provide a home for a lot of our pollinators. Um, it increases our water uh, quality. Um, it helps store carbon. Um, so grasslands actually store their carbon in their roots. So unlike trees where this carbon is stored up top, grasslands all the carbon stored in the soil so whenever a fire comes through it actually doesn't release the carbon back out right um 
<laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble for this one, but cause you know, um, I work for the forest service and you know, I'm supposed to be like, oh yeah, tree is awesome, right? I have a soft spot for prairies because I know that they have the better ability to store carbon when people are sitting here saying, oh, well, we need to replant all of our forests. I'm not saying that's not true. We definitely need to. Um, but we also need to think about saving our prairies, okay? Because those are very important habitats for a lot of species and we're losing them. Okay, um, the roots in the prairie grasses can go as deep as 12 feet or more. Example, big blue stem. That's pretty deep. Um, a live oak in Texas, the roots maybe go four or five feet deep, max. So live oaks are more likely to expand their roots going out and they can extend their roots up to 300 to 400 feet out from the actual tree. It's a pretty big area. So that's something we really have to think about. We're like, oh, well, yeah, trees are gonna hold in our soil. They do over an ex extended amount of time, but grasses are also gonna be a little bit better about doing that. They're also gonna be able to filter our water better um, after a rainstorm. All right, prairie restoration. All right, it's really, really important that you'll understand that this is a process. Um, and what y'all have tried the first time may not work. What you try the second time may not work. Third, fourth may not work. It takes a lot of dedication and you have to be 100% committed, if not more. Um, I've had people multiple times tell me, oh, I tried this, it didn't work. And so I'm just gonna plant Bermuda grass. No. <laughs> I have seen prairie projects take at least four years to start seeing any sort of sign of it actually working. All right, so step one, you wanna define the starting conditions and desired outcome. And that's with any project, any sort of restoration project that you ever do, it doesn't matter if it's trees or grasses or anything in between, you need to be able to define what it is now and what do you want it to be, okay? You wanna create a management plan. Again, that kind of goes with what do you want it to be? If you can't, if you don't know how to manage it, if you don't know all these things, then what's the point? Okay, so you kind of need to know this. And there's people out there in the Forest Service with Texas Parks and Wildlife. We are here to help y'all come up with a plan. So Texas Parks and Wildlife, if y'all um, want to do a wildlife management plan, they'll write you one. If y'all just want kind of like a forest stewardship plan, the Forest Service can write you one. Um, I've also thrown in grassland stuff just because that is also my background. Uh, step three, you wanna prepare the site. Uh, step four, you wanna know what to plant and best time to plant. Why is that important? If you don't plant something that's gonna naturally grow there in that soil type, it's not gonna work. If it doesn't get the type, right type of uh, precipitation, it's not gonna work. Uh, there's so many factors. One of my favorite um, answers to any sort of question revolving any natural resources, it depends. And I know that y'all have given that answer before. It's our favorite one. You know, because there's natural resources, not an exact science like, you know, biology in a lab or chemistry, right? There's so many factors. And so you need to put that into consideration. Okay, so if it's a warm season, it whenever to help decrease woody vegetation to creep back in have you really done anything so all right step one defining and starting the conditions and desired outcomes okay so this right here this is i kind of took this from google so the starting conditions, the woody encroachment on historically uh, cattle grazed property. Desired, we want an ecologically diverse prairie with both grasses and forbs. So ideally, we would like to remove all the juniper. We would like to replant with a mixed seed of both grasses 
and uh, forbs, right? And a lot of people don't realize this, but you know, uh, grasses are actually great hosts for uh, a lot of larval species. So they'll actually, so pollinators like butterflies, little blue system hosts 10 different um, butterfly larval species. And I had no idea about that until recently. And I think that's just wonderful. And I was just completely mind blown. Because you think pollinators, you think automatically flowers. All right, step two, create a management plan. I already kind of touched on this. The Texas a and Forest Service will create a forest stewardship plan. And then the Texas Parks and Wildlife can create um, a wildlife management plan for you. And that's free. So, cause it's kind of all, all included in the package deal. So it doesn't cost anything for us to be able to come out to the properties. We just kind of put it on our books and show up. Uh, step three. Okay, so I know a lot of people are not a fan of um, putting down herbicide. Let me tell you it works. If done correctly, read the bottle really, really carefully over and over again. Make sure you know what you're supposed to do, what concentrations you're supposed to do. That's all very important. And you don't want to over spray. Okay, fire is another one. Um, as far as clearing a site, really good at getting rid of the small woody vegetation species. Um, shredding some of the taller grasses also will work. Um, it's, these are kind of all intertwined and together, okay? So you will have to do a combination. It's not just a one and done. Okay, um, tilling is also great because you're roughing up the soil. You're exposing that bare minimal soil and getting it ready for the seed to go in. All right, step four, knowing what to plant and when to plant. So our cool versus warm season species for wildflowers, uh, the seed is best spread in late fall, early winter. I always get asked, and it's always really funny, they ask right in December, when's the best time to plant blue bonnet seed? Now. <laughs> and they're like, what, really? And I was like, yeah. I started seeing blue bonnet leaves early January across the state. I was like, oh, this is gonna be a great year. I'm like, so excited. Um, grasses, huh? Yeah, I think it just depends. Um, so your grasses, late winter, early spring, that's kind of a good time to do it. Um, this kind of also falls with um, if you wanted to do stuff like plugs, if you wanted to plant them first in the greenhouse, your grasses, you can plant in the, um, like that February, March in the greenhouse, and they'll be ready by May. Um, choose plants that naturally grow in the area. Really important. Um, it's best to use a mix of both forbs and grasses. And we're also talking about using a mix of different types of grasses. So you can do like a mixed prairie grass. So between your tall and your short grasses. So you're not just doing one. All right, step five is the upkeep. Fire is best. Um, doing it every three to five years, kind of mimicking that natural pattern. Um, this removes that woody vegetation trying to establish and it recycles nutrients back in the soil. Um, you cannot burn mow, uh, but be careful uh, of too much coverage. So when I'm saying that, I'm talking about you mow and you, you like you have really tall grass and you just let it lay over because that's going to block sunlight from being able to help germinate the seed for next year. And then reseed in areas that are thin if needed. Okay, so I'm going to jump back to fire. Okay. Um, Fire is great if done correctly and by professionals. Okay, so if anyone is ever interested, they need to hire someone that is professionally trained to do this. Because as we all know, prescribed burns can get out of hand if not done correctly and under the right environmental conditions. And environmental conditions can change in one day. I mean, heck, a few years ago, we had all five seasons in one week. And that's just crazy. 
but this is Texas and it's bipolar and it just likes to do its own thing. Okay, so I cannot emphasize that enough. If y'all, if anyone is ever interested in doing a prescribed burn, they need to hire someone who is professionally trained to do this. Okay, so I know a lot of y'all know y'all's plant taxonomy and ID. That's kind of just general knowledge, but I always find that it's really great to review it. Okay, because there's always like one little detail that you're going to forget, or you may um, not have already known, or you, you know, just didn't stick the first time around, right? So with uh, taxonomy, it's basically the classification, how we name plants or, or anything uh, alive. So we start with the domain and we go down to kingdom, which is plantae uh, for plants. Um, phylum or division, uh, we're talking about division between, okay, is it a flowering or non-flowering? Um, class, and then we go down to order, family, um, genus, and then species. And I just did one for corn. It's in Poaceae, which is our grass family. Okay, plant nomenclature. It's how we name plants. Um, common name versus Latin name. Why do y'all think it's so important that we identify plants by their scientific name? Yeah. They are. Um, he said that the common names are different from place to place. Almost every single species is gonna probably have at least two to three, if not more common names for that exact same plant. Yeah. Yeah, it does. She was saying that on some common names cover a whole bunch of different species. And it's, you know, that is actually pretty common to happen. Um, for example, um, uh, big blue sim is also known as uh, tall blue sim and turkey foot. Turkey foot makes sense, you know, because it has, it kind of makes a turkey foot at the top. Um, it's also really important anytime that y'all are writing a scientific name, you'll notice up here that the genus is capitalized and then the species specific is lowercase, but then it's also italicized. Now, if y'all ever handwrite um, the scientific name, you need to underline it. And that kind of sounds like a lecture, but it's really kind of important so that people know what you're talking about because it's just kind of general knowledge as if something is underlined you're kind of italicizing it, but handwriting. All right, plant morphology. Again, this is pretty basic information that I know that a lot of y'all pretty much already know, but it's, again, it's a good review. Um, your inflorescent structure, you have your raceme, panicle, spike, etc. Uh, leaf shape and arrangement, seed, flower, and roots. Okay, these are really important, but I will say that everything plant related is not textbook straightforward. Okay. Things fall off in nature. It gets really windy, limbs break off. Um, you walk by a plant, you maybe break off a leaf or a flower petal falls off. It's not as simple as what we like to make it look in books. All right, plant morphology, the leaves. There's a lot of different leaf shapes and this goes for both trees and grasses and forbs. It's pretty much straightforward all the way across the book. So our leaf tips are at the very top. And then we have our leaf margins right here on the left. and then leaf shapes at the bottom. Alternate, opposite, and world. So these are all pretty important. If you were in a But these two are still up there, right? 
that'd be taken into consideration whenever you ID plants. Okay, plant morphology of the seed. So whenever I first started with the uh, Native Seed Research Project, the first project I got was to go back through our seed collection and identify all the plants based off their seed. I had no background in, in plants before, had never even looked at a lot of these native plants. So I knew what the seed looked like before I even knew what the plant looked like. <laughs> so this top one right here is a little blue stem. And then we've got hairy grama. And then on the right is tall grama or Texas grama, sorry. And then we've got gay feather, which has the uh, typical uh, sunflower-like seed. And then we have side oats grama, which by the way, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but it kind of comes off like a flag, like you know the gramas like to do. But on that flag, there's multiple seeds on that one flag. Okay, and then this is milkweed seed. So kind of really important skill to have. If y'all are ever curious and you wanna to try to learn how to just identify seed, that's a great skill to have because sometimes you don't have other things to go off of. All right, the flowers. A lot of people don't realize, you know, grasses have flowers and they're actually kind of pretty. Um, one of my favorites is actually side oats, um, which is at the top left of the screen. Side oats, gramas, flowers come in all different colors. I have seen them in red and orange and pink and purple and yellow, and it's great, all in one field. But I mean, that, of course, that was a research plot and we planted them there and they came from all across the state. But so my kind of theory is that each flower color kind of comes from a different region. That'd be kind of neat to be able to find out for sure. Um, the middle one on the top is little blue stem flowers. Um, the one on the far right is the fragrant Gallardia. And then we have gay feather, milkweed, and then partridge pea. So they're all very unique, right? That was kind of the point of me putting up this slide is each one of those is really kind of different um, and very unique to themselves. Okay, we also wanna look at the monocot versus dicot. So kind of a dead giveaway for monocots they're gonna have more fibrous roots versus the dicot's gonna have a tap root. The leaf structures are also gonna be different. So our grasses are gonna be in the monocots. All right, plant ID resources. These are great and I actually brought a few of my books up here. So if um, y'all don't get a chance to like write down the names or if y'all want to be able to see what those books look like, I have them here with me, um, but they are these are some of my favorites. Um, on the top is the app for uh, My Tree ID with the that the Texas A and M Forest Service put together, and then iNaturalist, which y'all are aware of. I love iNaturalist; it's great. As someone who works in the science field and um, looking for specific plant species having people that are in the community that aren't necessarily in natural resources and looking for these plants, go and scan a plant, it gets ID'd, and then I know where to look for seed. It makes me really happy. Um, makes it a lot easier being able to find a lot of these plants. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through some of our more common plants throughout the prairie in this area. Um, if I went through every single plant that is out here, it would take days, <laughs> if not a whole year. It's, there's a lot. Um, so little blue stem is Shizacarium scoparium. This is very typical for what it looks like during the summertime. It's that bluish green kind of color. It's like highlights the prairie in my opinion. Um, it does the same thing during the fall. So y'all know this, whenever you're driving down the highway, you see more of the rusty red auburn color. It's a little blue stem. It's great. It looks, I would love to see it in more yard landscaping. <laughs> I think it looks so pretty. But also I have a soft spot for it because, you know, I, I spent two years on it. Um, bushy blue stem, Andropogon glomeratus is uh, whenever you see this out in the prairie, you're going to see it also in more wet 
regions. So like in little bar ditches, okay? Because it really likes wetter soil. Um, but both during the summer and in the winter, you're gonna kind of see like this fluffy kind of top to it. Now cleaning that seed out of that is really, really hard. Speaking from experience, yes, ma'am. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> Not here. So um, we're actually trying to plant this more. It is gorgeous and it holds soil great along areas that see um, that are more steep. And again, in the more wet areas, it holds in that soil very well. Um, on the right is kind of what it's gonna look like during the summertime when it's nice and green again, but you're gonna see kind of that fluffy top a little bit. All right, Cytos grama is Bautalua curtipendula. This is another one I would love to see more in home gardens. I think it is absolutely beautiful. And the fact that it produces all those different color flowers really, I think, highlights the plant um, during the summer months. And it blooms multiple times um, in the summer. So you can't really see on this picture, but it takes one little stem and it has multiple flags coming off of it. Yes, ma'am. No. No, so these are totally two different genuses. So yes, um, she was asking if, if Cytos grama is related to sea oats. And the, the answer to that is no, two different genuses. So your gramas are gonna be in the genus Bautalua. Um, your blue stems are gonna be a little bit more difficult. They used to be grouped together. Um, so little blue stem actually used to be an andropogon, but now it's the Shijacarium. Um, that changed, I believe, in 1994, 1995. So as we start getting into uh, the genetics and we start improving our ability to look at the genetics, we're seeing that there's actually differences um, in these plants. Um, here's kind of a close-up of the seed. Again, you can kind of see it just kind of hangs off. Yes, and it is the state grass of Texas. If you didn't know that, got to be Texas proud, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, but we want to, you know, share the glitter. Yeah. Well, that and, you know, one person will plant um, St. Augustine grass and it grows into their neighbor's yard, even if they don't necessarily like it. Or they do bamboo. <laughs> That's another one. A lot of people really don't like their neighbors after they plant bamboo and it spreads. Um, talk about destroying your lawnmower. Um, all right. So, Harry Grom, again, it's a grama, so it's got the genus Bautalua. And by the way, no one will ever question you whenever you say a scientific name if you say it with confidence. <laughs> that was probably the best advice I ever got as a grad student. Just say it with advice or say it with um, like confidence and no one's ever gonna question whether or not if you said it correctly because most people don't know how to say it anyways. So I normally just pronounce them the way that like I read them. So. The you know, lovely thing about being dyslexic is that you, you hear or you say things the way that you uh, read them or you hear them the first time. It took me a really long time to learn how to spell phone. I thought it was spelled with an F. Yeah. It is pretty short. So this is one of those short grass prairie grasses. It's going to be about this tall. Um, as you can tell, it's pretty bushy at the base. 
it's going to have a lot more leaves on it and you've got that typical grama flagging on the seed head. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a pretty tiny grass. Um, but it's also pretty common around here. Um, the next one is actually tall grama, or it should be. Yep. Um, so this one, the two are actually kind of um, tall grama is a variety of hairy grama. The difference is if you look at the base on the tall grama plant, it's not near as bushy, right? And then the stem that leads up to the seed heads are a lot taller, hence the name tall grama. I always had an issue whenever I was taking a wildland plant ID class and my teacher would bring in like little cuttings of the two and it's like, okay, this isn't necessarily a great way to teach this because the best way to be able to tell the difference between the two is looking at the whole plant side by side. So I always highly recommend doing that whenever you're trying to learn your, your plant IDs, especially with your hairy versus tall grama. Okay, your hooded windmill grass, Chloris uh, culata. It is pretty common around here, but it is an early successional grass. It normally will survive for maybe two to three years max, and then it makes room for new plants to come in its place. Um, you're going to kind of see, it looks kind of like an umbrella. If I had a picture of what it looks like, it's, it's pretty much like an umbrella. Um, it takes these little world, little stem-like structures and kind of goes out all the way around. Okay, its seed is black. As you can see there, but yeah, it is pretty common around here, but it will maybe um, survive for about two or three years and then it makes room for a new plant. So it kind of helps protect the seed until that seed's ready to germinate. Indian grass, Sir, uh, Sergastrum newtons. I know that y'all have seen this grass around. <laughs> it's part of the big four or big five, depending on which plants you wanna include in that grouping. Um, but it's really, I think it, it, it's very similar to Little Blue Smith, the fact that it highlights the prairie, um, not only in its leaf color, because it produces that same kind of bluish green uh, leaves that Little Blue Smith does, except for the leaves are a little bit bigger. Um, but it also produces that really bright yellow uh, seed head. But another thing about it is I'm pretty tall, I'm 5'11". I've walked through a plot of this stuff that had not been mowed all summer and it towers over me. Um, so <laughs> we talk about, I was talking to y'all about the history of the prairie. People, whenever they were riding their horses through the prairie, they used to have to stand on top of their horses, like on the saddle to see over the prairie, to see where they were going. That's just crazy to me to think that our grasses that were out here were just that tall everywhere. This is another one I think that would be great in a landscape. All right, Leavenworth uh, Irinigo. Um, you'll see this kind of during the fall when everything kind of turns um, brown. Um, it kind of highlights the fact of it, that bright purple, and that's not an exaggeration of the coloring. Okay, how many of y'all have seen this out in the prairie? Oh, yay. So many people don't recognize a lot of these, um, which is why I put them in here, but that one kind of just highlights and it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. All right, American basket flower. Um, this one is an annual. So it, you know, meaning that it only grows that one year and then it puts off the seed and it grows again. Um, this one smells lovely. I love whenever I get to walk through a field of American basket flower because it just, it's great. Um, but it kind of has like a purple pinkish kind of color on the flowers. All right, Maximilian sunflower. So even without the flowers on this plant, you'll be able to recognize it. I'm assuming that a lot of y'all have seen this as well. Okay, have y'all seen it without the flowers on? Do y'all know how to recognize it? So it kind of looks like a bush, right? Um, it'll be like around like some short grasses and then all of a sudden you have like this tall kind of like bushy like structure and in the fall it gets those yellow beautiful sunflowers. All 
widow's tear. I love the name of this because I think it's so accurate. Um, I kind of, I'm really bad. I like to play with these because if you look where the flower actually comes out, if you squeeze it, it produces a little like teardrop and it kind of comes out, but it, I think that's so cool. And I think that's so accurate for this flower. Um, an interesting fact about this flower is that each one of these flowers only blooms for one day, pretty much only for the morning and then it goes away. So each flower that you see is a brand new flower for the next day. Um, oftentimes you'll kind of see these underneath uh, cattle um, rails and everything or in areas where cattle can't get to them. Cattle love to eat these and these love to not be eaten. So um, they will actually grow in areas where they can't get, um, so if they can't get to them. All right, white prickly poppy. So this is actually gonna probably start blooming in May or June or so. Um, it is very, very prickly and I don't recommend just sticking your hand into it. Um, it really hurts, speaking from experience. Um, I wanna say annual, but don't quote me on that one. So there's so many plants in Texas um, not just speaking about prairie plants, but also tree species and trying to remember which ones do what is really hard. That's why these books are great. And Google. Google is my friend. Um, but it, this is, it's um, pretty distinctive in the fact that it has that nice white flower. And then um, on the inside, you have the yellow and then the very red. And then I'm not going to get into all the different structures of a flower that would just take too long. So I'm not going to do that. Um, golden dahlia. All right. I'm assuming that a lot of y'all have seen this as well. Okay. There's a lot of different dahlia species. Um, this one is really nice in the fact that it smells wonderful. So, and that's even whenever the flower is not blooming. So whenever the seed is all nice and ripe, if you go and collect the seed, you got some free perfume. It's, it's awesome. I loved collecting the seed off of it. Um, but most dahlias kind of have this shape of the flower, but they'll have different uh, colors on their petals. All right, the yellow Texas star. Okay, one, it looks like a star. But two, whenever it doesn't have the flower on it, the seed still looks like a star. So if you're ever out collecting seed, that's a pretty distinguishing factor. Okay, native plant courtesy, because I have to include this in here um, because there's so many people that go out and do this stuff and they don't take into consideration um, all of this. So never collect all the seed that you see available. Um, the reason for this is that we want that uh, plant species to be able to keep repopulating that area, right? We want it to spread, we want it to feed our native wildlife species. Um, we never wanna collect seed if you notice that it's the only one in the area. People do this a lot um, and you really just don't wanna do that. Um, you never wanna dig up a native plant uh, when it's the only species of that one in that area, okay? Um, again, this is people, people do this a lot. So we have to kind of make these courtesy rules um, so that people aren't doing it. They also do it with rare plants, rare and endangered. Um, so if you're not sure, please do not do that. Um, we're working really hard at, at trying to repopulate our endangered plant species. All right, so some resources that you can kind of go off of. You have the Native Prairie Re Association of Texas. They're a pretty good organization to get involved with also. Um, they do a lot of pres uh, prairie restoration projects in the area. Um, the wildflower.org website, it's through the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. I'm sure a lot of y'all have heard of it. Um, have a lot of y'all been on the website? Yeah, it's a great resource. So, and a lot of people don't realize that it's there. So I'm always telling people about it because you can go in, do a plant search do a plant search for a specific region in Texas. And then you can choose, okay, I want it to be a perennial or an annual 
or I like only reds, yellows, and oranges for the flower colors. And you can go through all these different categories and it will narrow it down for you. Um, if you're ever looking for sort uh, for a seed source, seedsource.com, it's through the Native American Seed. Um, they're a great resource. They're really quick about getting the seed to you. Um, they have seed mixes between both uh, short grass and tall grass, but then they also have wildflower seed mixes. Um, and then Brit. Brit is a great resource. I love Brit. Have y'all gotten to tour Brit? Oh, I love their plant herbarium. You know, that's something that um, I'm a major plant nerd, so I, I got very excited about this. Okay, so something that we have just started, um, we are now on social media. Um, you can find us at the Central Texas page of the Texas Animal Forest Service on Facebook. It's the same for Twitter um, and Instagram. And then my contact information is at the bottom of this screen. And then you can find me at this address also. And I am, if I am in the office, I'm more than happy for you just to come in and ask a question or just say hi. Um, all right, are there any questions? Don't be shy, I won't bite. Yes, sir. Okay, so he's asking if a plan turns into agricultural land and then the agricultural land turns into an urban um, area. If, he, if the native plants will still grow in that area, yes. They will, their roots will still establish, they'll still go deep. Um, but again, you have to be patient. Um, you know, things don't always respond the way that you want them to the first time around. But if you are persistent and you are committed, it will it will make it, okay? And um, it goes back to making sure that you're planting the right plants in the right region, uh, making sure that those plant species can handle that pH of that soil. So if you're not sure about your pH on the soil, have your soil tested. You can send your soil off to the, your um, county extension agent and they can take care of that for you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the recommendations for can care of that. Okay, our blue stem. Okay, so she's asking in, in recommendations for eradicating KR blue stem. Okay, so there is actually a lot of research going on uh, with eradicating KR blue stem. Um, one of the ones that I have seen is taking a tarp and putting it over your KR blue stem area. Um, it kind of bakes those plants. It allows their seed to not spread. I don't know how well it does necessarily at fully killing the plant. Um, again, you know, a lot of this. A lot of ranchers really like KR blue stem for their cattle. So it's kind of hard to get rid of and try to convince people that they need to fund our research to get rid of this mm -hmm. grass that is their livelihood. Um, so to answer your question, there's not a full proof way yet. I wish there was. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Can an acreage as small as an acre or sandwich and sport? Uh, my, so her question is, can a, an area of land as small as an acre or smaller can support a prairie? So we have these things called micro prairies, um, and you can create a micro prairie in your yard if you wanted to, or even just having a small little uh, pollinator garden that includes a mix of grasses and forbs, because this is going to allow a home for a uh, home and feeding resource for a lot of our pollinators. Our bird species, a lot of our native bird species actually rely on our native wildflower seeds and plant seeds. Um, you'll find that, especially in like little blue stem, rabbits love to make a little home in the center of the bunch. So do um, quail and other uh, ground nesting birds will make a home in the center. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can make uh, little micro prairies in your yard and it doesn't have to be very big. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I need to make this, I need to have a huge area of land to be able to make a prairie. No, we can make little micro um, prairies where we can. That is a great question. Yes, ma'am. I know that you said that you're not supposed to uh, dig up plants, which I totally get. But if you know that you have like a 
um, an urban situation where they're going to be plowing up a bunch of stuff to build, you know, methods to whatever. And all of the, let's say, milkweed is sitting there. What do you do with all of those tubers and how can you get them? Okay, so her question was, if you know that an area is about to be established into an urban area and it was historically, it has all these wildflower species and grass species, what do you do to be able to save those plants? Uh, because I had mentioned that you can't dig up those plants. Um, the answer to that, and I have done this, I have actually called um, city officials before and asked if I can go onto that property and collect seed. Um, I would not be opposed to going in and digging up the plant. Now, some plants do not respond well to being transplanted once they get established. So that's something that you need to keep in mind is that even though you dig it up, it may not be established. But collecting the seed and making sure that you store the seeds properly, that would be, I think, acceptable. Just make sure that if it is an area that has been marked off to the city and it is owned by the city, make sure you have permission yeah, because technically really, that's theirs. Yeah, this particular land that I'm looking at is not owned by the city, but I have reached out to the, to the landowners and have not had a response. Mm -hmm. oh. Any suggestions on how to increase my price? I would just contact them. So we try to contact them some more um, because Texas has this lovely thing where, you know, majority of our land is privately owned and we don't like people getting on our property. Mm -hmm. So I would make sure that you have permission first. And even like a government agency cannot go on someone's land without permission. There have been, my coworkers have had guns pointed at them. <laughs> it is a real thing. Um, so make sure that you have permission. We don't need anyone pointing guns at anyone um, because this is Texas and we like to do this. Um, yeah. Kimberly, there's one uh, question from the uh, remote audience about tips on starting seeds. Since collected seeds can be hard to terminate. Yeah, okay. So um, question on starting seed. Um, like in a greenhouse, I'm assuming, or Germ okay, um, just trying to get the seed to germinate. This is this is where that um, answer of it depends comes into hand and comes in handy because seed germination ability varies from year to year based off of that previous year's conditions. It can be based off of um, temperature if it got too hot or too cold too quickly. Um, precipitation can influence um, a plant's ability for that seed to be able to germinate the next year. There's all these different factors. Um, as far as getting it to germinate, it depends. It's a very specific thing. There are some species that will germinate very easily. Little blue stem and hooded windmill, for example, germinate very easily. Um, Eastern gamma grass, on the other hand, does not germinate very easily. I've had maybe one or two um, plants actually germinate from seed that I planted and I have tried multiple years to try to get it to germinate and it's just really difficult. Um, some seed, so this, again, it's very seed specific, or plant species specific. You need to look up how that plant responds. Gay feather, for example, needs to be in a very cool environment before it will germinate. So putting it in a freezer. Um, that's kind of, the it depends answer is very real here. It's very species specific. Um, and I wish I had a more, uh, a better answer, but I will say here, you know, a little light of hope is our native plant species, they wanna grow, they wanna grow here. So they're actually relatively easy to get to grow here. Um, I will say that our native plant species, they do like compacted soil. So if you, um, plant them in a field or whatever in a, uh, your yard, make sure you compact the soil back down. Okay, they really like that compacted soil. If you're in a greenhouse, make sure you compact that soil really nice and tight before you put the seed in, put another layer of soil on top and compact it again. I have compacted, normally whenever I do seed in the greenhouse, I compact my trays three times. So I do, I do one layer of soil, compact another layer of soil and then compact and then I do seed and then I put soil on top of it and then I put I compact it again okay it really really loves compacted soil you also have to look at the fact that some plant species are going to want to grow in different type of soil mixes okay 
gay feather really likes more of the sandy soil. So you kind of have to, it depends. <laughs> answer I can give. Yes, sir. I have 22 acres that I have a neighbor that runs cow plant, but I would really like to restore it back to a prairie, but I don't have an ag exemption on it. <laughs> Cow on it. Mm -hmm. and is there any way to add going to a prairie because that's you know less than the quality balance and all of that? No, I think that you could because just having the cattle on it should give you the tax exemption. You only, I believe, you only have to have the cattle on there for a certain amount of time a year. So. Probably. I would talk to your county extension agent. They would be able to give you a little bit better guidelines. Okay. Yeah, I would I would ask um, county county extension agents and your wildlife biologists are going to really know how to get you those wildlife or ag uh, tax exemptions. Yes, ma'am. Is there any tax exemption to have to restore a prairie? Okay, so the question is, there, is there any tax exemption to restore prairie? I believe that would fall more underneath the wildlife tax exemption because you have a tax. You're providing a food resource for your native uh, wildlife species and pollinators. Um, for your wildlife tax exemption, you do have to have three uh, things. You have to do three things off their list, um, either by providing habitat um, helping with erosion control. So there, you know, you're, if you have an area that is likely to have erosion control, you planting native plants, there's your uh, erosion control right there. Um, putting up bird houses or bat houses also would count. And that's super easy to do. Um, so. Oh, well, we just had a uh, just had an inspection, and like she said, you had a, a plan on what three things you're doing on whether you're providing habitat. We have bird houses. We also have uh, a rock carrying area where we're doing erosion control with native plants, which rats. Yeah, yeah. So they have on. They make it pretty easy to do the wildlife. I will say, in order to get a wildlife tax exemption, you have to, I believe, first be at. You do. So but it's you can't just jump out of it. Um, so you have to have the ag before you can go into wildlife. Anyone else? I love questions. Okay. I'm gonna kind of stick around. So if you'll have any questions and y'all are just kind of scared to speak up. Um, I also have my books up here and I have um business cards also if y'all need to get in contact with me. All right. Thank you. all Thanks for that very informative talk because, you know, this is all near and dear to our hearts. So but thank you. OK, thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Kimberly. OK, everybody, it was uh, 45 minutes for business, so 0.75 for our um, service and an hour and 15, so 1.25 for our AT. All right. Thank y'all so much for coming today. And uh, let's get back out there and make spring happen. All right. Thank you.